Thank you. All right. Now I'm sufficiently embarrassed. Um, but thank you. I'm so, I'm really glad to be here, as you just heard um, from Dr. Hollis. I'm from the area. So actually until January of this year, my in-laws actually lived in Villanova, like five minutes from here. And I grew up in Balakinwood. And they all, all of our family, my, my parent, my dad, my in-laws all live in Balakinwood now. So any chance to come back to be here, but we've been trying to plan this for a few years. So it took, years, it took a little while. It took a little while to, to get here. So I'm really excited um, to talk with you today. Um, as you know, I'm mainly going to talk about our work on reducing food waste, but I thought, um, especially, I know many people here are undergraduates, and I know you're probably thinking about what you might want to do. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I do more generally and about the, the, my program, the field, and, and what it might look like if you're thinking about doing work in food more generally. So I'm going to um, briefly, what um, the Food Law and Policy Clinic is, what clinics are in a law school setting are organizations where we teach students in the classroom, but the bulk of my teaching credits are really students doing hands-on projects for real world clients and organizations, um, and we work on a bunch of issues in food. And the reason that I started getting interested in food, my background in law school was, I went to Harvard Law School, I was really interested in international human rights, so I love watching this video of all these wonderful places, and I was doing a lot of global work. Um, and I, as you heard, I spent some time in rural Mississippi where I got really interested in, in issues of rights, of basic rights, of basic needs in, here in this country. And in particular, I got really interested in um, the food that people were eating. So where I was in the Mississippi Delta is a really agricultural area. If you stand anywhere, you look around, there's just fields of things growing everywhere. But what's growing is not generally food. It's, you know, crops that are used for... Um, biofuels and ethanol and animal feed and cotton, which you can't eat. Um, and so at the same time in these communities, there was a lot of issues, people having access to healthy food um, and a lot of people coming and complaining that they didn't have any vehicles, they couldn't get to the grocery store, they were you know, s really struggling to get a meal. So I really realized food has, is, impacts a lot of the things that I care about and that I think all of us should care about or hopefully do care about. Um, so a big one is the impact on the health system. Um, so in the U.S. we now have the majority of people living in this country are either overweight or obese. Um, about a third of people are, more than a third of people are, have diabetes or pre-diabetes, which is diet related. Um, there's, so there's a lot of, of diet um, impact on health. And then there's also a lot of people who don't have access to food, either because they live too far from a grocery store or because they don't have the money. So that's one thing I care about. Um, food has a huge impact on environment. I'm going to mainly talk about this today. But um, just to point out one thing that, that really struck me, um, not just the water use and the, the emissions, but there was a recent study that was done by, it was commissioned by um, the food industry, I think by Nestle, um, to really analyze the, the external costs of the food production system in the U.S. And what they found was that the environmental externalities of food production are 224% of the revenue that industry gets. So when you think about that, more than double the harm for every dollar that they're making on selling food ends up being you know, pollution and damage to the environment. And then, as I'll talk about, that's even worse when we produce so much food that we end up wasting. So every one of those dollars of harm is exacerbated if we then take that food and throw it directly into the trash. And then food to me is also really a social justice issue for all the reasons I mentioned, the, but also I think if you look at who it benefits from the food system and who suffers the burdens of the food system, it's very related to race um, and to other disfavored categories. So food insecurity, um, so not having enough food to eat at a given time or throughout the year, is two times as, as, as much of an issue in black and Latinx households and in, the, and in the homes of people working in the food system. So it's another externalized cost that the people growing and producing food or working in restaurants, et cetera, can't even afford to put their own food on the table. Um, diet-related disease as well. And then this last point, just as a one data point of who is benefiting from this, is that um, when you look at who owns the land that's farming, um, like 96% of, of farmland that's owned by, by individuals, not by the government, 
is owned by white farmers and they get almost 98% of farm payments. So I think there's, you know, there's equity issues there as well in terms of who's, um, when I think about my definition of sort of what food justice is, it's that there should be an equal benefits and burdens from this system and right now there's quite unequal benefits and burdens. And we work on all of these issues. Um, whoops, so I'll just briefly say, I'm gonna mainly talk about, I think our biggest area of work is around reducing food waste, and I'm gonna talk mostly about that. But we work also on, um, we have a client that is, we're helping them pass policies to increase the pay for restaurant workers and bring restaurant workers up to the um, regular minimum wage instead of the sub-minimum tipped wage, and also working on policies to increase racial equity in terms of professional development for restaurant workers. We've done some work in Navajo Nation on helping them understand the laws that apply to in Navajo Nation so they can have more sovereignty over their food system. Um, we work on uh, a lot of food policy councils, so I helped start one in Mississippi, which was a group of volunteers and different stakeholders from across the food system and we work with them on a lot of policies to make it easier to farm, to sell food to local schools so that we could really rebuild a lot of the local food production community. Um, so in my clinic we work on all these different projects and then um, as you heard this my clinic is the first one in the country so when I graduated from Harvard Law School I was in Mississippi for a few years and got really interested in food issues and was successful there in passing some laws um, and I also was bringing a lot of law students down to work with me. So at the end of the two years, my dean, who is now our former dean, said, I, I don't really know what you do, but students really like working with you. Do you want to come back and, you know, do what you're doing here? So for a few years, we went on like that. And then, and I, you know, was able to build this program. And she still sort of said, you know, I'm not sure what you do, but everyone's happy. Just keep doing it. <laughs> then I started getting calls from other law schools saying, we like what you're doing, too. Do you want to come, you know, teach here? And, um... Then the dean said, well, now we want you to be on the faculty. So they, you know, but it took a long time really convincing people that as you, if you do something that's really new, you have to have a lot of confidence that what you're doing is meaningful and important. And I think I got a lot of confidence from students, not only at Harvard Law School, but I have always taken students from around the country for summer internships, including I often will take um, one or two undergrads each summer. And just seeing that there was interest in the topics, that we had more than enough organizations reaching out saying we really want to better understand the laws that apply to food and how to make changes so that we can sell food that's healthier so we can you know support our communities reduce the amount that's being wasted and um, so I think it, it paid off in the end and now a lot of my work is building the field so I helped launch the Academy of Food Law and Policy which is a association for law faculty around the country that are now teaching in this space, which is only a couple years old. We also have an annual summit where we bring about 70 law students from around the country for a weekend long boot camp in food law. It sounds really dorky and it is, but they're all very excited to be there um, because I think for a lot of them, they, they're really interested in this topic and they may be at schools where they don't have an opportunity like my students have to learn this. Um, so we always have, you know, way more students apply to attend that than we have space for. But it's been great for us to get um, students in different parts of the country interested and then they're able to go back and work on these things in their community. Just as an aside, yeah. I see your Twitter uh, handle right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. Please do. Yeah. So I'm going to... T turn to now talk about um, reducing food waste, which is the main thing we work on. I think the reason you're all here. Um, so I'm going to first talk a little bit about the issue and the, the impacts of the food that we waste, but I'll turn mainly to solutions because I think in my work I'm very much practical. You know, what can we do? What can we change? Um, so this map is really helpful to see the fact that, that food waste is really a global issue. And there's been a lot more attention in the last few years. In fact, um, since 2015, a, a bunch of countries, including the U.S., have announced a goal to reduce food waste by half by 2030. Um, I think in the U.S. at least, we're not necessarily making much progress towards that. Uh, there's been some progress that I'll share at the end, but I think there hasn't been like a framework that the government put out with benchmarks to meet so that we can make sure we achieve that. Um, but about, uh, about a third of food produced globally gets thrown away. The other thing that's really interesting about this map is, as you can see here, North America is the only region where the orange circle is larger than the blue circle. And what that means um, is the blue circle is showing food loss. 
this is food that's sort of getting lost before it gets to the end of the, the chain, before it gets to the store or to the consumer. So that's food being lost right out of the fields or even in the fields. A lot of it is really bad in, you know, in, in sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia because of uh, lack of cold chain. So sometimes if you take, if you harvest crops and put them into a truck and you don't keep them cool, they continue to ripen and by the time they get to market, they've gone bad and they get thrown away. What's different here is that we have the orange circle which shows food waste. So this is food that's discarded by consumers um, and they also will include in that food that gets all the way to the retail, to the store and gets thrown away there. Um, so in the US, more than two thirds of our waste occurs at restaurants, at stores and in people's households. And that's what that means, that we're the only region of the world where that's true. That, um, so it means that this is a really a global problem. Some solutions will be the same in different places, but also we need to be really creative about thinking about the solutions here because it's happening at a different part of the chain. And also um, there's much more environmental impact because if you think about it, we've harvested the crops, we, we put them in a truck, we took them to some place, we, we cut them up, we packaged them into plastic or whatever materials, drove them to the store, and then maybe someone drove to the store to get them and drove them home. All of those inputs went into food that we then throw away. Um, and what that looks like in the U.S. is about 40% of our food gets wasted. So, I mean, a huge amount, you know, nearly half. It's just, it's, it's really unbelievable. 21% um, of water that's used in the U.S goes to water crops that go directly into the trash. And, you know, I think the, the amount of resources, um, and then once food is in the landfill, it I is a huge awareness of how much food waste impacts climate because of the inputs in production and the climate impact of agriculture from tilling land and cutting down trees to plant things, all of these things have climate impacts. And then what I mentioned, food being in the trash and emitting methane. Uh, so this was a to the August report from the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a huge report on agriculture and climate. And what they found was that um, food, food loss and waste contributed about eight to 10% of total um, greenhouse gas emissions globally. So I think just, uh, you know, and what's interesting is um, reducing food waste is actually a really good solution because it not only can benefit the planet, as I've just shown, but also has other benefits. It's one of these sort of triple bottom line solutions. So, you know, in terms of people, as I was saying earlier, there are a lot of people who are hungry. There's a lot of people who can't afford enough to eat, who can't access food. And a, lot, and, and, and a large majority of the food that we throw away, especially in this country, is very safe and healthy and edible. I mean, it's gotten all the way to the store or even to someone's home and is getting wasted there. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities. I'm gonna talk a lot about ways that that food can be redistributed. Uh, so in the US, about 12% of households are food insecure. Um, and what we've seen is actually in some states that have chosen to restrict the amount of food that can be thrown in the landfill, they immediately see an increase in food donated to food banks and food recovery organizations. So Vermont, for example, passed a law that said food can't be sent to the landfill. It's, it's a little more complicated, I'll get to it in, in a little bit. And they immediately in the following year saw a 60% increase in donations of safe, edible, healthy food that was then able to go out to people around the state. I mean, not all of the food is safe and healthy. There's other things we can do with it besides sending it to a landfill if it's not, but what a waste when we know there's people who need it to be throwing that food away. And then in terms of profit, if we actually treat this food as a resource, there's a lot of money to be made. Uh, Massachusetts similarly passed a law restricting the amount of food that you can throw away. And in the two years following that, they saw a creation of 500 new jobs, another 400 jobs that were sustained that maybe would have were, were sort of um, uh, not sure that they would have continued to go on if, it, if not for this resource, and $175 million in new revenue generated. So where is that going? So it's food banks hired more people, more people were needed to drive trucks to transport this safe food around, um, there were new jobs created in the composting industry and anaerobic digestion, and then the anaerobic digestion and compost create another resource which then can be sold. So I think just by treating this resource as a resource instead of treating it as trash, we can help people, we can help the environment, and then we actually can see that it can make money. Um, so it's been interesting since some of those studies have come out, a lot of states are now looking at this as really a potential economic development tool um, because it can create jobs and value. 
So now I'm going to actually ask you to be more interactive. Why do you think we waste food? What, I mean, any, any thoughts? What, you know, think of a time you threw something away. What would be a reason that you think you might waste it or someone might in this country? Yeah. Mm -hmm. People have some means, instead of buying, for example, one right. loaf of bread, they buy two, mm -hmm. or they buy three. Right. And most likely, uh, out of those three, one and a half will mm -hmm. be wasted. That's and the, uh, there's really good data, actually, on that point, just that uh, people, there was an ad campaign run by the Natural Resources Defense Council and the Ad Council. They did some research, and they found most people will drive across town for a two-for-one deal to get the free you know, loaf of bread or whatever, and then they almost always throw the, the other one away. So there's evidence to support that. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's one uh, reason uh, why we waste uh, food that is valuable to, to yeah. individuals who have nothing. Uh, another reason is the overuse, so mm -hmm. overstock and yep. then overuse. For example, you want to prepare a meal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Example, rice. Mm -hmm. You say, okay, we are on three people. So again, the same principle. Mm -hmm. You tend to overdo the amount of rice that you prepare. Right. Meat, right. Uh, uh, chicken, whatever, right. you know. Anything and everything, particularly in our society that, that yeah. tends to see things as as abundant, mm -hmm. as redundant, as plenty mm -hmm. of it. I mean, there's no there's no um, that sense of uh, uh, rationality. Mm -hmm things or to think about it. Yeah. You just keep talking and doing things. And Without I think really any, any good reasoning to do. And, and we've come to a world that we really have to think about right. all those tiny, petty things mm. that in the past didn't really mm. matter. Mm -hmm. Today they do matter a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And on that point too, we in the US today, we, we spend the least um, of our per capita income on food of any society ever in history. So while we know there are many people who still struggle to put food on the table, as a whole, we are spending very little of our income on food. And so I think it holds less value. People are less likely to feel upset when they throw food away because it's not hurting their bottom line. What are other reasons you th think food's sort of right? Yeah. Yep. Where, um, food items have like better, better regula federally regulated to have those uh, expiration dates mm -hmm. and those aren't accurate because um, those, those dates are mostly uh, best sold by yeah. best sold instead of like where, where I spend my time as a lawyer, as a lawyer working in policy, there's lots of ways that policy plays a role. So we just heard regulation is one. There's questions about regulation, lack of clarity. Sometimes there are regulations that don't allow certain things. For one example, we've worked with um, a couple different companies that are trying to do things, new things, new startups in the space here, and they're trying to do things that weren't allowed before, and they're running into the fact that the laws don't allow it. As one example, there's a company that's taking um, excess crops that were grown for animal feed and trying to turn them into crackers and other um, processed foods. Because they were classified as animal feed, they're not allowed to then be fed to people even though they're showing, well, what we're doing is safe, these were going to be wasted anyway, and it's actually a better use to give them to people rather than to animals. Um, so that's a regulation that need, would need to be changed to allow something like this. Labeling, we heard already the labeling on food products. Um, sometimes the labeling is confusing or costly, um, but there's ways that you can make changes to those policies to allow it. And then I'm going to talk about a couple of these um, other ones. But even things, government does things like education, just even having, spending the time to put together resources or a website. We worked with the New York City Health Department and helped them put together a really nice packet of information. Every store that they go to to do their health inspection, they give them a packet that says, did you know you can donate extra food? Here's the places you can donate it, and here's the rules, that, the protections you have. Just even you know, spending the resources of government to do that level of education will help to make sure that more food gets into the hands of someone that needs it. So I want to tell a little story about date labels, and then I may not get have much time to do some of the other topics, but I can answer questions about them. Um, so I'll just walk you through how we get involved in this and how I think about these issues. So um, in my program, we take on client organizations. And my students' job is to 
get to understand the organization and help them. Um, we, our first client in this space is an organization that is now called Daily Table. When we took them on as a client, they were a small idea in the head of a really wonderful man who was the former president of the um, grocery chain Trader Joe's. And after he left Trader Joe's, he said, um, I saw even at this really environmentally conscious store how much food gets wasted and I want to start a store that would sell at a very low price food that otherwise would be thrown away. But I found out that I'm not allowed to do what I want to do because one of my ideas was to sell food that's past the date but that we know is healthy because we know that that date is about quality and not about safety. Um, so that, you know, in Trader Joe's we saw this food every day get thrown out but because of my food safety background I know that it's still safe and I'm not allowed to do this, so will you help me find a new idea? So my response was, well, if the date isn't about safety and you're confident it's not about safety, what a weird law that would require us to throw that away. Let's see if we can change that law because it's probably impacting lots of people. Um, and what we ended up doing for him was we started by uh, looking into the laws in Massachusetts. Um, he, was, he was trying to figure out where to start his business, either in Massachusetts or there were a couple other states. So I said, well, let's look at all of them. Let's see which is the state that's most favorable to what you want to do. We found two really interesting things. The first thing we found was actually that it wasn't illegal in Massachusetts to sell or donate food after the date. It was the food bank chooses not to do it, and they've been going around saying it's illegal to do this. But it wasn't actually illegal. So one thing that's, that's been true in a lot of my work is when we actually look at the laws and we can, um, there's a lot of sort of myths out there and it's because um, it might be complicated to do something or it's hard to pay a lawyer to do it. So we're out there giving free advice and helping people see what they're allowed to do or not. So we found, you know, one, he could do it in Massachusetts. It was a little bit complicated because food was required to be separated if it was after the date versus food that was still before the, the Best Buy date. Um, and the other thing we found was that in the states he was interested in, all of their laws were different. So one of the states had no requirements on date labels and you could sell them after the date, donate them, do whatever you wanted, there was nothing. They in fact had, it was New York, and actually New York City had previously had a date label requirement on milk, but they eliminated it. And in the, in the rule eliminating it, they said, this has no impact on public safety because the date is only about quality and therefore we don't need this law, it's causing waste. And Massachusetts, where we were, this, the rule was the food needed to be separated and that it could only be you know, sold after the date if you knew it was still safe and it was clearly marked. And then in Michigan, which was the other state, the rule was you had to get a statement from the Department of Health saying whether the food was safe or not. So we started looking at more and more states and what we found was across the entire country, there were no two states that had the same rule, which um, I don't know if you, anyone here is involved in, any, in science or has taken even a class in science, but usually if something's based in science, you would expect that at least a bunch of them would be, the rules would be the same. So if the science said that these dates are really about safety, then a bunch of states would have laws that were similar. The fact that they were all completely different, what you can see here, 41 states had some requirement and they all had requirements on different food products and they were all really different. Um, as one example, a lot of states have requirements on milk and dairy and some of them set a number of days that after the production that the date needs to be. Uh, so. Um, uh, Pennsylvania, I think, is one of those states, and it says the date needs to be 17 days after pasteurization. In Montana, it was 12 days after pasteurization. I can tell you the process that they're using to pasteurize the milk is not different in Montana than it is in Pennsylvania. And then the other states have milk dating is actually quality dating. Since it's pasteurized, it doesn't become unsafe. And then it would require the um, Food and Drug Administration and the Department of Agriculture to actually educate consumers so that people can actually know what they're looking at when they find those dates. Um, so we'll see. I don't know. This Congress, um, I was actually in Congress last week presenting on a different project. Um, they're busy with an impeachment investigation. So I don't think this is the top order of business at the moment. But I do think we've uh, made a lot of progress on this issue. Um, and I'm going to skip through a couple of these. I was going to mention a couple of things, but just to show you a little bit really quickly the progress. I know we're running a few minutes late, and I'm sorry for that. But um, there's, this is just, just since 2015, 
the number of federal bills and, and laws that have been introduced. The bold ones are things that passed and were enacted. Um, so the Farm Bill, which is a huge piece of legislation, for the first time ever now includes food waste and has some programs to try to reduce this. So I think on the whole, we're seeing a lot more awareness. And then what we're seeing is we're tracking state bills and we're seeing that across the country, a lot of different states are introducing and passing legislation. Um, and here you can see kind of some of the issues. So date labeling, um, there's about, I think, six or seven bills out there right now. The green ones means that they've already passed. This is just this year alone. Um, we were tracking it for last year too. The two most common are things we talked about around donation. So the tax incentive is, we talked about the cost of donating. It's not free to store and transport the food. Um, so a lot of states, uh, there's a federal level tax incentive, but states are also saying, how can we um, uh, pass a tax incentive that would support food being donated and, and help offset the cost? And then on liability, which we mentioned as well, making it clear that businesses have protection from liability if they donate food to try to get more of them to be donating. Um, I wanted, I actually forgot to add it to the slides, but if you're interested in what's going on, if you're from Pennsylvania or interested in getting involved here, we did a report a couple years ago with a group called Phil Abundance. That's the main food bank that serves this area. That was just a, a policy roadmap for Pennsylvania, really, like what are all the things Pennsylvania could do on all of these areas. And now there's some legislation introduced in the state that is trying to get some of that passed into law. So there's, um, it was pretty cool to see. So if you, if you want to learn more about that, I'm happy to stick around for a little. We'll hang out. We'll have some snacks yeah, we have time for and a oh, questions too. Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to do that. Yeah. Well, we certainly want to... Yeah, we, got, we almost had a hand in the back. Yeah, we got one. Yeah. So when you guys were looking at all the states, yeah. um, did you guys look at where like, that law for like, date labeling, for example, was, was introduced? Yes. Was it commonly voted in? Yes. It's a really good question. So the, I think your question is like, where did these all come from if they're not based on science? So just anecdotally, because I talked to a couple uh, legislators who said, you know, I went to the store for a barbecue at my house and I went to buy some hot dog buns and they were past the date and I thought people in our state shouldn't be buying hot dog buns that are past the date. So I, I wrote a bill and passed it into law of saying no food will be sold after the date. I mean, like that is really what happened. So, and that's why they're all, they're all like random food items. And uh, I will, uh, interestingly in Montana, I think there is a more um, pernicious reason which was it was a protective law for protecting Montana dairies. And I would hazard a guess that in Pennsylvania it's a similar thing. The way that it works is that if all products have to have a date that's pretty soon after pasteurization, then by the time milk or dairy comes from another state, it'll be closer to the date. And you know what people do when they go to the store? They go through and try to buy the, the carton that has the latest date on it. So in Montana, there's actually a federal lawsuit about this law um, from dairies outside of Montana saying, you know, you're just trying to protect your dairies in state. And they actually had evidence that that was the case. They didn't win in court. Um, I think they probably should have. But um, so I think there's like a bunch of reasons it comes from, but none of it was based in science. None of them said, you know, we got a scientific report that said that we should do this for, for food safety reasons. So thank you. That's a great question. Can you rely by that? That's a good question. Um, no, that what we put out a study this summer actually saying in uh, about half of the states actually, there's at least one food product right now that you can't use those standard labels. And that's another reason we're saying we need a federal law to do this because um, in some states, like in Montana, you have to put sell by on milk. So even if the other food products will have those two standard labels, milk will still say sell by. Um, so, you know, I think it would take a really long time to go state by state and fix this. As we saw, a bunch of states are trying and are introducing bills. Um, Massachusetts has been introducing one in the last few years. We keep going to the legislature and saying, we support this. This is a good move. Um, interestingly, Pennsylvania had a bill introduced in the last session that was actually going to require date labels on more food. And we work with Phil Abundance to write a letter to the state legislator saying, we think this is a bad idea, here's the science, here's like a bunch of evidence, and it, it, you know, he removed the bill, which was, I thought, a good outcome. In view of all that, uh, is there any interest in farmers to debate this, or are, are there any bills in, uh, on the table? 
so the bill I mentioned is on the is introduced. It's on the table. Um, they are not moving very quickly to do that to do it. But I think um, you know it's there's more legislators signed on to it. I think it's honestly the way that Congress works now. It's very hard to pass even a very like basic small bill. Um, it's just, you know, it, it, the, the smaller the bill, in fact, the harder it is. So I think our best hope is getting it inserted into a bigger piece of legislation, and we've been trying to do that in a couple big pieces of legislation. Like, there's one that will be coming up that's um, the Child Nutrition Act, which is the legislation that funds school meals, the WIC program, the, the program that provides food in child care settings. So we're trying to convince them to add this small piece of language onto that because it's all about food, you know. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, I, I, to me, it's very, it's like a very basic, it's very simple, um, but I think it's, it's hard to break through the gridlock. Yeah, as a lawmaker, do you think it would be easier to go to all states and propose a unifying kind of law mm -hmm. that would affect every state, you know, regardless of the yeah. central federal state? I mean, federal yeah. That's what we're doing right now, <laughs> but it's taking some time. Yeah. 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 Well, we're just about out of time, and I want everybody to have some of our vegan Snacks. desserts. No yeah, animal products so involved, and they're delicious. You'll yeah. see. It's an and I just wanted to thank you for all your work. I mean, we see that you're, uh, it's, it's a great model of how academia, government, nonprofit organizations, um, the consumer themselves, all working together. Yeah. You know, it's a very holistic, and that's what we need uh, in terms of changing food policy. Yeah. So yeah. thank you so much for yeah. your work. Thank you. Thank you.